Yeah, good morning. Um, just a few, before you leave the room, whenever you leave, there's a bunch of stickers over here. Just grab them, I'm not going to take them back with me home. Um, my name's Marcus, I work for Lightband, obviously, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about microservices, but um, I learned a lesson from world's famous Josh Long, um, and he said, like, talk the first 10 minutes about you, just exclusively you, what amazing stuff you do and whatnot. Um, most of you don't know me, I assume, uh, so I'm, I'm around since a couple of years already, have been talking a lot about Java EE and have a very enterprisey background. Um, I haven't been a consultant for all, uh, I haven't been a, a developer advocate for all my life. I actually worked as a consultant for more than 14 years in the field, um, been pushed around by customers and all that kind of unfair experiences. And uh, whenever you get a chance to share your knowledge and um, try to make a difference for everybody else out there to not make the same mistakes, to not run into the same discussions over and over again. This is basically where I started blogging and started to, to speak at conferences. And uh, I have to admit, over the last couple of years, it's, it's been kind of a, a road track for a couple of conferences. But the one thing I'm mostly proud about actually is uh, Javaland. So if you haven't heard about Javaland, this is pretty much my own conference running in Germany, um, I think it's end of March next year. So whenever you get a chance, just drop by. Um, it's a community-centered conference, strictly developer content. I don't want to have a lot of architect talks, um, so you will definitely enjoy it, hopefully. That should be enough. Developer Advocate is a cool title, actually. Let's talk about systems today. The requirements towards our software that we have to design are plenty. And um, if we just look at the, the most prominent ones today, it's probably all motivated by mobile devices, by internet-connected things in general, like cars, sensors maybe. The most pressuring thing that we have to handle is real-time responses. Real-time and Java and the JVM, that's a challenge uh, on itself, not speaking about the applications running on it. So we have to be always up. We have to be always connected. Those applications tend to be very business critical for most of the customers out there. And um, whatever application we actually want to design, we need to make sure it's actually usable. That looks pretty easy if we think about our local development environment. We have maybe a couple of cores, at most four, eight locally. We have maybe a server that is just running single individually. But putting everything together into a working application that can actually stand workloads significant workloads today, we run into all kinds of issues. We need to cluster our application, we need to think about distributed systems, and we actually need to think a way, about a way to handle the massive amount of data underneath. And um, the question is, how do we do that today? Um, I'd like to know a little bit about you. So what's your technology that you're using right now? And the option, first of all, is Java EE, question mark. Who's using Java EE? One, two, three, four, five, a couple, one third maybe, even less. Um, who is using something reactive like Akka, Play? About the same amount. Could also be Vertex and stuff like that. Okay, now I'm interested in what the rest is using. Sh shout at me. Just let me know. Spring. Spring. Fair. Deal. So who's using Spring? Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Monolithic applications. Funny. Um, let's look at the history. So this is um, pr a pretty interesting chart, actually. Um, it's the internet users over time. The internet maybe connected things, even. <laughs> And the timeline shows pretty well where the individual technologies that we're 
working with, that we're bummed with in terms of buzzwords, came up all the way. So roughly 40% of the world population today has internet access. And uh, the number of internet users actually tenfold from 99 to 13. What I found most interesting is that the roots of J2E slash Java E have been laid down way back. And Spring came in to make things better because J2E was literally unhandable back in the days. Some fancy kids came up with Ruby on Rails. What's the most famous application built on Ruby on Rails? Twitter? Correct. It's actually Twitter. Twitter started out as a Ruby on Rails application. They never looked into Spring. They never looked into J2E. And I think I have an idea why that could be um, actually the thing. They actually ran on an RDBMS. First of all, so all the tweets got stored centrally in MySQL for in the first versions, which I found very interesting. So um, when did Twitter actually start to run into scaling issues? So that was around 2009, when they actually had enough users that they actually outscaled Ruby on Rails, MySQL combinations. And they pushed everything gradually over to Scala in that point. So running their stuff on a JVM. And um, yeah, Akka microservices and all the stuff that we've been, that we're talking about um, everywhere, literally, came up way later. The Reactive Manifesto in 2013. So that's where scaling became its own vocabulary. And um, I think looking back, we have to admit that we actually kind of used the right tools like the JVM, but we mostly built the wrong things, at least when it comes to scale. And the effects haven't been very visible because we haven't had to fulfill all those requirements. A simple departmental Java E application is pretty much enough still for many, many things that we have to deal with on our daily uh, basis. But the world is actually changing. And um, data becomes something that is always available and that always needs to be processed. It's no longer resting in a relational database somewhere. It's actually in flow. Let's try to make a good example. So my, my uh, perfect and favorite frequent flyer program is Miles and More by Lufthansa. Thanks, guys, for all the upgrades that I don't get. Um, when I take a flight, which I do a couple of a year, um, I'd really like to see how many miles I get credited for in my account. When actually, uh, question, when is Lufthansa adding those miles for a flight I took today to my account? Oh, they are a lot better. They have actually nightly batches. Oh, okay. They do have nightly batches. Yes, but um, that's a good, good explanation, right? The amount of data they have to process is something that they only can do, obviously, in nightly batches, for whatever reason. Um, or they haven't designed the systems to do exactly what I, as a customer, expect, to see my miles when I basically leave the plane they should know that the plane landed successfully on time or not, and I don't see a reason why they can't re-architect their systems, right? But how needs a system, well, what, what qualities, attributes does a system need to fulfill all those fancy requirements and handle data in flow, in motion, instead of uh, resting data and just um, processing everything synchronously? a bunch of requirements and attributes. It needs to be asynchronous, right? We want it to be non-blocking. Um, it should be able to handle information in real time. Highly available, for sure. Loosely coupled, sure, I'm an architect. I've been working with technical teams of 200 people. 
I don't want to have the big spaghetti ball at the end of the day. We need to have a solid piece of software that's well designed. Um, what's my other favorite? Push instead of pull is actually something that's also very important these days. Thinking about WebSockets, I don't want to refresh my email inbox. I want to get a notification when I have a new email, right? So there's no longer this old HTTP request response model that users are used to have. They really want to be notified. And at the end of the day, whatever we do, it needs to be able to handle a significant amount of throughput. Hmm, buzzword bingo, right? So what's the, the biggest solution that we came up with over the last couple of years? It's the microservices Kool-Aid, right? And I have to admit, I don't like the word. I don't like the word, and um, I don't like how people actually are chasing that pick through town, like we Germans tend to say. Um, it is something that we've been doing since a couple of years already, and started out with loose coupling, componentization. We've always been striving for great architectures. And there's not something really new in that whole microservice thing. And um, on top of all that, micro kind of is is an is implicit size indicator, right? Um, when I first started talking about microservices way back in my, in my Java EE times, the most prominent question I got from the audience was like, what's the perfect size for a microservice? Lines of code? Kilobyte jar files? I think that's been my favorite. Anybody else? Any ideas? What's the perfect size for a microservice? It's just, it's stupid wrong at the end of the day. Um, and many, many people have an opinion about micro, nano, pico services. And I've I heard people talking about all kinds of size names for micro services. And um, I still find it very weird. And I, I'll give you an answer about the right size of a microservice in, in that talk. So we have a bunch of challenges business-wise. Millions of connected devices, millions of users, like even my mom uses a smartphone today. Wouldn't have been possible a couple of years ago. Um, what else do we have? We have a bunch of requirements towards our applications, what we want them to behave like. And we know that we want microservices, like loosely coupled good architectures. So what do we do? This is kind of the ecosystem and enterprises today. Well, do, do we need to have a specific technology to build a microservice-based architecture? Question mark? Who's an architect here? Nobody? One, two, three. So yeah, do, do we? Like, I have an opinion. Theoretically not, right? Because microservice-based architectures are, first of all, architectures. And it doesn't really matter if you use Vertex, if you use .NET, maybe. Um, it, it really doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, we all come way back from enterprises that, dis that made a platform decision years ago. And for very good reasons, they picked mostly Java EE as their base operating system for everything. So even if, you, if you're programming Spring, you're pretty much hopefully running it in some kind of servlet container, at least at a minimum, um, which could be Tomcat or whatever. So. If we want to want to have a framework that encapsulates everything that I already described, we should probably look at something that is based on the JVM and gives you everything out of the box. And yes, there's actually an ACA sticker here. And obviously, Lightband has a bunch of technologies that maybe some of you already work with, like Play and stuff like that. 
But um, honestly, it's, it's really complicated, and the learning curve is pretty steep. And um, to help developers master that kind of technology stack, especially those coming over from a Java E enterprise world, um, we came up with something called Lagom. And um, if you ever wondered what the name stands for, it stands for just right. It's kind of the, the Swedish way of living. So never take the last cookie. Always share. Just use and take whatever is right. Not too much, not too less. Just the right amount of something. And um, this is exactly the perfect description for, for services, isn't it? Like looking at how big services should be. There's no lines of code. There's no by a byte code size. There's no nothing. They should be right sized in terms of architecture. They should do one thing well, and all the buzzwords that you probably probably heard in, in earlier microservices talks. Um, and you're raising your eyebrows and say, another one? Aren't there enough microservices frameworks already? Honestly, Lagom is not really a big framework. It's actually a small layer of glue code on top of something that is rock solid and proven and already in production in, in many, many enterprises. And the idea behind this is to switch perspective a little bit. So no longer just build your applications for efficiency and robustness, but also re-architect them towards flexibility and res resiliency. And instead of just pushing all those buzzwords out and giving you a very powerful framework to do whatever you want to do, Lagom actually has the approach to guide you very, very closely in what you do and what you don't. And um, we, we like to say Lagom is very opinionated, which means if you're following the principles, you will have a rock-solid and easy microservices system. Because having one microservices uh, service is like having no microservice. Um, you need at least a couple of them to build a real system out of them. So what are those opinions in Lagom? First of all, the assumption is that a very solid architecture and everything that we learned over the last couple of years is even more important in microservices systems than, uh, than it ever been before. Especially domain-driven design is something that I personally believe will help you identify the right services and the service boundaries. Lagom uses a couple of those constructs. It's not mandatory to have a very solid domain-driven design, um, designed application, but it really helps. Context boundaries pretty much define your service boundaries with Lagom. We also use event sourcing as a core principle between services and for persisting in Lagom, which automatically leads to CQR as, as a persistent co persistence concept. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit deeper. And um, to make our microservice system reactive and fulfill all the requirements that we put on our microservice-based uh, applications before, it's um, based on reactive technologies. Aka, Play, for example. And we also believe that development experience matters. Have you ever seen a Spring Boot talk? Obviously. Um, firing up 20 services and 20 terminals just to have an application running, that's not exactly convenient. And if you need to have your local development environment with, let's just say, five services, you really want to have a convenient way to run all those five services in an easy one command kind of development environment. And this was priority number one in Lagom to give you a very good development experience. Yeah, and last but not least, I mean, having a jar file 
doesn't let you put anything into production. So instead of mingling around with containers or images or various deployment options, Lagom also takes you all the way down to production um, in, in an easy way by automatically integrating with something that's called Conductor, um, which is our deployment solution. So CQRS is basically uh, the backbone of the logon persistence. Anybody heard about that before? Oh, just four or five, perfect. So what does it mean? Command query segregation, response... So um, it means, basically, in clear words, uh, that you are separating the read side of your persistence from the write side of your persistence. Why is that important? JPA works just fine. Anybody an idea? Non-blocking? Non Might be non-blocking. The reason is, yeah. Again? All perfect, perfect valid reasons. So obviously, CQRS um, solves a bunch of problems. Um, I think the, the most important one for me is um, that databases, especially uh, relational databases, have one big drawback. They can only be optimized for either reads or writes. You have to decide if you want to have very, very performant writes or if you want to have very, very performant reads. And depending on the capability of your DBAs and your performance teams in classical Java E architectures, they try to balance that and try to get the best for both worlds. But if you're really running into high load situations and you're looking for the sub millisecond response time, especially when it comes to loading data, this is something that RDBMS can't do anymore. And this is where the idea came from, to separate the reads from the writes completely. Um, actually, when a user requests something like data from the database, you are accessing a complete separate view on the data, which is optimized for the individual use case. It doesn't have to be a full view on every data that you have in your application, it can be fully optimized for every single individual service. And the right side actually updates the data store, which is pretty easy. And um, honestly, you can implement that with something like Hibernate, and can also make that work. But it's kind of pain in the ass, and nobody really wants that. Um, so there are a couple of frameworks out there, just plain Java frameworks, that also try to implement the CQRS approach for simple classical Java applications, Lagom basically encapsulates that approach for you. So you don't have to handle it. You have a couple of APIs, um, a, a particular persistence API that is optimized to work with Cassandra, and you can simply use it. And uh, by the way, I'm, I'm talking about Lagom as, a, as I'm a vendor and want to sell something. I should mention that Lagom is open source. Apache license, so you can go to github.com slash logom and just try it out tomorrow and just run everything you see in production. Um, so there's nothing to sell here, just uh, a bunch of technologies which are really interesting and give you a very great, great way as a Java developer to start playing with the microservices field. Um, and um, from now on, I'm going to actually call microservices a little bit different because we learned that we actually don't want micro, we want right-sized services. And um, the translation for that is pretty simple. It's logom service, right? Um, so we want to implement logom services. And uh, if we're looking at the persistent entities, which is like the best comparison I have towards um, JPA entities, we still have those in... Uh, in Lagom, they implement aggregate routes from the domain-driven design approach. And um, those entities get the command for state changes, and they actually get persisted, um, which is kind of an event lock. Whenever you change something on a persistent entity, those change events are captured. 
Lagom can also cluster, um, so you can scale out your individual nodes, and um, the persistent entities actually get distributed over the complete nodes. And with the event sourcing approach and the stored deltas, you see that the, the difference to a classical entity persistence mechanism with CQRS um, are pretty obvious. Instead of completely removing data, like in the example down there, from the database, let's say we want to remove our friend Bob here, Bob is no longer in our database. With event sourcing, you have a complete state change history for every individual data change that you have on your entities. And this event lock basically gives you a rock solid auditing capabilities. You don't really have to care about that and you can actually replay the state of every single entity at any given point in time. Um, even if one of your uh, cluster nodes blows up, this is totally replayable because the data has been captured on the, on the, re on the right side. And um, what else? We have a bunch of uh, advantages. It's actually easier to test. So we don't have to preload our database. We only have to preload the events log. And we can totally see every individual change trigger something and updates entities. So the persistence side is new, pretty easy. The read side is even easier. So from the complete amount of events and data that we captured with our persistence, we can actually derive particular attributes that we are interested in for the read side and create tables for them. And for every individual logom service, exactly what we need. Not just accessing complete entities, like my, my favorite example is the customer entity that blows up all the way through the project lifetime of five years because somebody has to add an attribute um, once every development cycle. Um, we can just give you another view on this entity, another read view, and it's exactly optimized for the use case that we, you want to have it for. Um, plus, you can also optimize it for different database systems or analytics platforms, which is also a big plus, especially in enterprises. Something I should also mention is that we keep all the data in memory. So the events are going to be replayed and you have all the data available without having to actually access them. And um, to replay those events and recreate the entities, the persistent entities in memory, is pretty easy. Um, the downside is that the read side only supports eventual consistency because there's a delay between replaying the individual events and putting them into the read side optimized table that can take a second and uh, leads to eventual consistency. What else do we have in, in Logom services? They are actually reactive. Um, and with Arca Streams underneath, uh, it's completely asynchronous I.O., complete asynchronous communication is a first-class citizen. This is something that has an influence on how you write Logom applications because you are, you are doomed to work with streams. Um, whom of you is, are, is already using uh, Java 8? Perfect. Who's using the new collections API? Mm, fair enough. So this is what it feels like programming in Logom. Um, using a lot of streams, working with Aka streams is something which is comparably straightforward. Um, all the important concepts are, ca are actually um, implemented and encapsulated in, in Logom APIs. So you don't have to learn a lot of new features. As I said, the API layer is comparably thin. And uh, I already talked about that everything we did in Logom uh, is based on something that is out there since a couple of years already, um, especially Akka cluster, uh, clustering. The one biggest drawback for now is probably that Logom works with SBT, 
Who has ever worked with SBT? Oh, well, I'm surprised. That's more than five hands. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, it's something even I, as a, I'm a Java E developer, honestly, I like Maven. And I spent a lot of time wrestling that freaking system and understanding it. And uh, now that I have to learn how to use SBT, world isn't getting better right now. Um, but I can promise you one thing. So Logom is uh, basically in technical preview right now, and the 1.0 release is about to come out. I was hoping to be able to announce it today, but that ob obviously didn't work out. Um, it only led to the fact that I can't show you a demo today because nothing is working anymore. Um, but uh, SBT is at least at, at one particular thing a little bit better than Maven is. It is a complete development environment. You can completely program SBT, and there are a bunch of plugins that you could use. And uh, we actually invested quite a bit to make SBT and Logon play very well together. You can, with a single command, run all your microservices in a single JVM on your development PC. The development environment also fires up the service gateway and the uh, service locator. Plus, you have the embedded Cassandra database. So just executing SBT run all fires up your complete microservice-based system, which I find very, very convenient. And um, I mean, there's still a bunch of uh, dependencies down there, naming, name it Maven or SBT or Ivy or Gradle or whatnot. They all rely on some open source libraries. And if everything's local, you can start a complete microservice-based system in under four seconds. Um, compared to WebSphere Liberty, even that's still pretty fast. Um, so I really like that approach. What else is there to say? Um, I have a nice slide, which is something that I haven't seen before, which tries to summarize the individual parts of, of Logom and give you a little bit more of an orientation how to use it. I've been talking a, a lot in new technology, CQRS. Um, what about JDBC access? What about FTP? We're running an enterprise. We still have host system somewhere, and we really need to transfer that file. Um, so yeah, there are a bunch of integration points for Logom, and they are all basically based on ACA streams, and there are a bunch of connectors that you could use and implement. And the good part is, because Logom is already based on this um, existing stack, you could also plug in everything that you potentially already developed somewhere. And, um, I haven't found a single thing in terms of technologies that I couldn't do with Akka Streams at that point. Um, if somebody is missing any particular technology or integration technology, um, just let me know. I'd be happy to look at that. <coughs> Lagom uh, 1.0 will have a couple of, of new features and changes. Um, one thing in particular is at the very moment, when you're starting to implement individual services, you have basically binary couplings between your services, which is something that we don't really want to see. So we'll have um, a new way of handling that by generating Swagger-based um, APIs and having automatically consuming the individual client um, dependencies. So this is upcoming. There's a lot of new features that we have from our user base already. And the 1.1.0 will be really, really amazing. OK, small recap, takeaway for whatever you want to take away. Reactive microservice framework work for the JVM, which is pretty true for more than Logom in general. Um, focused on Logom services, right-sized services. Um, fully synchronous, highly productive, and that's pretty true. Um, and it takes you all the way to production. The last part is something that you need to play around with. Um, Conductor is actually pretty cool. It's free for development, and uh, you can try it out. But if you want to run it in production, you actually need a license for Conductor. If you want to try out Logom, um, give it a shot at the project website or the GitHub repository. Um, there are actually a bunch of examples already that you could use to dig into. Um, when they are running again at the 1.0 release, hopefully soonish. What else do we need to 
need to talk about today. Because I've been scratching so many different individual topics that are totally underrepresented and really hard to talk about in one talk, we did stretch a little and wrote a couple of books. So the first one was done by Jonas Bonner, and he was, ta he was basically reflecting on everything he thinks is important for building a reactive microservice architecture. And believe it or not, this is basically the business design for Lagom as a framework. I've never seen a framework written after a book before, um, especially, yeah, may maybe one example is Spring. Uh, Rod Johnson wrote a great book before Spring even existed. So this is kind of the relation that this little book has uh, with Lagom. Good news, it's only 80 pages, roughly, I think even 60, and it's free. So just go get it, download it, um, no need to pay anything, just give me your email address. I actually don't have printed copies here. And because architecture is only one side of the metal, um, I took the liberty to wrote kind of a follow-up book, which is also roughly 65 pages, and talks about how to develop microservices. And um, it's also free. Ta-da! Present time. Um, it guides you and um, walks you through the complete example um, application. Uh, honestly, it's not a complete example, but um, have you ever heard about the uh, cargo tracker example? Uh, Eric Evans' book, Domain Driven Design. So this is the first steps toward that. I, I built two services and made them have read side, write side, walk you through CQRS as a first um, persistence API examples. And this is pretty much a good start for everybody who wants to get hands dirty and uh, deep into Logon. If you're still not convinced that you, that you need microservices, and um, if you want to talk a little bit more positioning, maybe even with your bosses or somebody else around, there is an, an old book of mine. It's not really old. It's, it's I don't know, three to four months old. Um, it is m a more general positioning around Java E and microservices. Um, what to do, which alternatives are there to decompose your monolithic applications, slicing them up and still staying productive. And uh, it also has a couple of, of patterns in it. Um, and believe it or not, it's also free. So for attending my talk today and not sleeping away, um, you basically get three books for free and a couple of stickers. And I do have some party invites for you. Um, so whoever wants to come to the DevRocks party tonight, we're actually hosting them together with uh, Couchbase and Atlassian and Tommy Tripe. Um, grab your invite. I have a bunch of, of them lying here. 13 minutes, a little more than I expected, but still enough to probably answer questions or hand out stickers. So fire at will. Yes, sir. Again? Um, can I choose persistence technologies for the event sourcing? Um, at the moment, not. It's pretty bound to Cassandra. Um, it has a Cassandra optimized API. Uh, theoretically, because everything is based on ACA persistence, there are other options. Um, and I totally invite everybody from the community co to contribute some other persistence adapters at that point. But yeah, as of today, it's Cassandra. Question was conductor license. Yeah, it's free for development use. Yeah, just Docker image. That's all. Docker. To make it easy for you to set up, it's it's basically a bunch of Docker images um, that you have to run locally, yeah. and yeah, that that works. It's it's a pretty amazing system, um, but honestly, you already have the complete development environment from Lagom slash SBT and. Um, 
I haven't found a need, at least not during development, to actually deploy my individual services as bundles uh, via conductors. So it's, it's definitely not a prerequisite. It's more like an option. Um, because that's exactly what many, many other frameworks don't give you. They give you the final artifacts, like the JAW files, the zip files. And everything else is up to you. So what, what, should I like terminal Java Jar run? Or what, what should I do? I mean, build Docker images and just put them on OpenShift or AWS? Um, and I think that's an, that's an important point. Um, if we're talking about a microservice framework, we really need to make sure it covers everything and make sure that people can put whatever comes out there into production. Um, so Conductor is the production end of the whole framework. Again, not really necessary if you only want to develop. Um, it's, it's actually different, um, different instances of Cassandra in production, if you set it up correctly. Um, it's one Cassandra database in development, and I think I'm not totally sure it's just different tables, but I'm, be, I'm happy to look that up in more detail. So follow-up question would be, how do you ensure, so you're talking about real-time responses, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that's more more general microservice architecture thing. The right size services are f fully and self um, fully s and self con contained. So that includes data. If you have the need to replicate anything between database instances in a, a microservice based architecture, you're probably doing something else. So my question was around. So you've got a read and a so write and a read. Yeah. So how do you ensure that you've got like hundred percent accurate data in your read? That that's only eventual consistency. That's not ensured. There's no guarantees in there. Especially the right side. how you organize your microservice in your IDE? Also, do you have, for example, one repository per project or per microservice? And um, how does SBT uh, integrate into the IDE? Because you said um, there's one uh, SBT start all mm -hmm. uh, command, and then all the microservices are fired up. But my IDE is not tracking them then, right? You cannot debug them or mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually a more philosophy question. If you want to have multiple builds or put all your individual services into one big build with SBT, um, you can do both with Logom. It doesn't matter. If you um, have them, I, I found it most convenient to have all the services in one build. That's pretty much the, the approach that makes your development the easiest, locally at least. And um, they are fully integrated, like um, IntelliJ has an SBT plugin, um, Eclipse has an SBT plugin. The only thing that's not really 100% right now because of uh, lacking SBT support is NetBeans. But as long as you're running Eclipse or IntelliJ, you should be pretty fine. But, but how, how does this look then? Also, I know the Maven integration, for example, but that is only used to compile the stuff, uh, yeah. set up the class class. Um, but um, to run the dialogue, the run dialogue, for example, to start a single microservice is not managed by Mave that you have to do by yourself. Yeah, that's a little bit different for SBT. But I'm happy to take that offline and probably in German. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you so much for attending my very early talk and have a great DevOps UK.